evening, everyone. Good evening, good evening everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Happy midweek. Yeah. Thank you. Happy midweek to everyone. We are glad to join you today uh, for today's worship. And before we begin, uh, let's have a short prayer. Let's bow our heads and pray. Dear God, we thank you for this wonderful evening that you have given us. Help us to learn from you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today's presentation is on time management. We are going to highlight the key verse for today's topic, which is from Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 to 17. And I'll be reading from the New King James Version. It says, so then be careful how you live. Do not be unwise, making the best use of your time because the times are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Our presentation will focus on the following. Can share. Okay. We will talk about what motivates the topic, why time management, what does the Bible say about time management, and three particular skills that separate time management success from failure. And then lastly, we are going to have an activity on truths and myths about time management. Uh, before we move to the next slide, we are requesting if you could share. Hello. Uh, we would like to share the screen. Yes, you can. Go ahead and share. Thank you. Sorry for the small uh, technicality. Just bear with us for a second. Are you able to see our screen? Yes. Yes, brother. Okay, thank you. Okay, now we will talk about what motivates this presentation. Okay, sorry. Now we are going to be talking about the motivations, as Sister has already said. This presentation is motivated by a recent academic paper in the Harvard Business Review magazine. Uh, January 2020 issue by Professor Eric C. Dierdorf. In summary of the findings, Professor notes that, and I quote, there is certainly no shortage of advice, books and blogs, apps and apps, all created to boost time management with ready to apply tools. Yet the frustrating reality for individuals trying to improve their time management is that tools alone won't work. 
you have to develop your time management skills in three key areas, awareness, arrangement, and adaptations, unquote. In the paper, the prof Professor Eric notes that most people are familiar with the key area arrangement, but not the other two time management areas, which are awareness and adaptations, which we'll try to put more emphasis on in this presentation. The next question is, so how do we become better managers? We will look at the Bible verses on time management. And also the second step in this evening, we are going to review among other things, Professor Eric offered evidence-based tactics to improve in the three areas, which three areas of um, management, which are awareness, arrangement, adaptations, which we'll briefly review later. Well, before we go any further, I'm going to tell you this short story. I know some of you may be familiar with it. You might have read it or you might have heard it from somewhere. Now, this story is entitled, Time is Gold. Uh, there was a certain man who was friends to a king. So one day the man went to the king and said, there are so many people who complain that I don't get anything done. I don't get any work done. And now I'm looking for a job in the area. But unfortunately, I can't find any because my enemies have gone around telling people that I can't get anything done. And then the king said, okay, let's strike a deal. Today, before the sun sets, I want you to come to the palace and I want you to collect gold, all the gold that you wish to collect. And the man was very happy about the offer. He went back to his home, to his wife, and he told the wife about the good news. And then the wife was also very delighted about the good news. And then he said to the husband, I think it's time you go to the king's palace now because you know, time is gold. But then the man said, he started feeling hungry. So he said, okay, please can you prepare me some lunch so that I will eat and then I'll go after lunch. After the wife had prepared the lunch and the man had had the lunch, he said, okay, let me just rest for a while and siesta, and then I will set off to the palace. And then the man slept for two hours. After some time, he woke up, and then he started going to the palace. As he was walking, it was very hot. And then he saw a tree and a beautiful shade. And then he rested under the shade and said, okay, let me rest for a while. I'll still I still have time to get to the palace, so I'll still get my gold. And then he slept. Unfortunately, he slept for five hours. So when he woke up, he, try he, he tried to walk fast as he went to the king's palace. And unfortunately, he found the gates of the palace closed because he was late. Now, what is the moral of this story? We can find that this man had a very good arrangement with the king. Well, he had been told he can come and get some gold. Remember, the man was looking for a job, but he couldn't find any. And he had been told that the reason why he couldn't find the job is because he didn't get anything done. And now the king had offered a very precious thing to him. But unfortunately, the man did not get this opportunity. So time is re really important. So now in our day-to-day -day life, what are some of the time management experiences that affect our life at work, at school, at church, and everywhere else that we go? Well, we have some project creep. We have sleeping deadlines, and we have a lot of to-do lists that seem to be endless. Now let's look at this motivation from Sister Ellen G. White. We'll take a leaf at uh, some of the lessons that we learned from, his, from her writings in Christ's Object Lessons. Now she says, our time belongs to God. Every moment is his, and we are under the most solemn obligation to improve it 
to his glory. Of no talent he has given will he require a more strict account than of our time. Now, the value of time is beyond computation. That's the next thing that she says. Christ regarded every moment as precious, and it is thus that we should regard it. So time is a very precious element. Now, what is time management? How is time management defined? In the Oxford Languages uh, Dictionary, it is defined as the ability to use one's time effectively. Uh, or productively, especially at work. In Professor Eric's paper, he defines time management as the decision-making process that structures, protects, and adjusts a, a person's time to changing environmental conditions. Now, what are some of the benefits that we get from time management, from good time management? Well, good time management enables us to work smarter, but not harder. And then we are also able to get a lot of work done within a short space of time without having a lot of pressure and with less stress as well. From Professor Eric's quotation or definition of, of time management, we see that there is emphasis on decision-making process. So in all that we do in our awareness, our arrangement and adaptation, we see that we need to put more emphasis on decision in order to be able to have well-structured schedules and also to be able to be prepared to adjust to the changing environment. For us to better understand what time management is, we try to look at what management is, how management is defined because time management as a component of time and the general management. So what is time management? We looked at various sources, and one of the sources simplistically defined management as the process of dealing with or controlling things or people. And then secondly, we look at another definition, and this definition attempted to define management in a different way. And in this time, management is defined by, by management functions. Management is defined as management functions, including planning, organizing, staffing, leading, or directing, or directing, or directing, controlling, and proper planning to ensure that our goals are accomplished. This organization can be in the form of a company, a group of many people, or one person and an organization, as long as this management or the people who are interested in this task purpose is to ensure that the accomplishment of goals is, is, is achieved. From this, only these two definitions that we have provided, you can see that there is a divergence between these approaches. Some of the definitions are so simplistic that they will lead to they will lead to different applications and outcomes in management. For example, emphasizing on the first definition is so simplistic and it only refers to management as a mere process of dealing with or controlling things or people, which is almost taking the same approach as the first definition of time management that we got. But the second one is a little bit more elaborate and try to highlight the complexities of management. As read, it involves the planning, organization, staffing, and other things. So from this myriad of definitions, we can see that the takeaway is management is more complex than mere process of dealing with or controlling things or people. And this can be applied as well in time management. Now, 
We are also going to look at why time management. Now, time is one of the three constraints in a project management triangle. We'll realize that everyone has a project in life. This doesn't apply only to professionals who go to work, but even at home, at school, everywhere, everyone has a project to take care of. So time is one of the three constraints in a project management triangle, which include uh, time, cost, and scope. And all these have to be effectively managed. Time is scarce and it is uncontrollable. We can't control the sunrise and the sunset. And then once time is lost, we cannot recover it. It is an opportunity that is lost as well. Well, we can do something about cost, but we can't do anything about time. And then time belongs to God. This is the most important one. We are only the stewards of time. Failing to manage time damages one's effectiveness and causes stress. Sometimes we complain about too much stress or oh, there's too much work, probably because we have not managed our time properly. Now, what are some of the application uh, time management that we have in our life? For example, in our church, we have young children who are pathfinders and adventurers, and all these have activities. Before they have the activities, they have an induction ceremony. And then later on, they will have an investiture. But the investiture won't happen before they do some projects. So they have to carry out some projects and they have to do them managing their time effectively. And then at school or at college, we have the students. They get into a certain level of education and then they have exams at the end of it. In between, they have a lot of projects to manage. How about the adults? Okay, those who are professionals, they have deadlines to meet, they have inspections, some have auditing, and some have evaluations. So depending on any profession that we have, we would see that everyone has a project to manage. And then at home, we have so many things to do, and we need orderliness in our houses, and we also have to work effectively to manage our time. And at church, we have the Bible study, and sometimes uh, some of us will think, okay, let me just do everything on Friday evening, then on Sabbath, I'll be ready to discuss the lessons with others. But our Bible study is structured so well, we have to do everything on a daily basis. And if we manage our time effectively, we'll be, do we'll be able to accomplish everything that we set on our daily basis. Just to emphasize on the uh, project management triangle that we've already touched on, we just need to stress that uh, from these three elements of project management, time, which is actually the scheduling, or whereby we set a date to do something, is very, very scarce and is uncontrollable. And then this theory of project management or model of project management is such that it emphasizes that for you to be able to deliver a project, these three elements of management, they have got to be managed effectively. And there has to be a balance stricken between these in order for us to be able to finish to deliver the project, which in this case is what is in the center, which is the quality. Quality simply is defined as expectations or customer satisfactions in, in delivery of the scope which is this scope. Scope is a product, but for you to be able to provide a product that meets the expectation of the, the, the client, it has to be delivered in quality, which can be in terms of product, project, or service, the way you deliver that project, with reference to time, cost, and also without compromising with the scope. So you will realize that based on this model, once you compromise with one, any one of these, time, once you delay in your delivery, based on those who are running projects, there has to be an increased cost. Or maybe also, they can be in the form of a lost opportunity. 
And again, once the budget is affected, generally it also affects the scope. You have to reduce the quality of the project or the scope of the project just because of time. Out of these three, like we said, cost and scope can be adjusted, but time cannot be controlled because this is God's time and it's very scarce. Next. What does the Bible say about time management? Under this section, what the Bible says about time management, the first point that we have looked at is we need to plan carefully with wisdom, taking into account the Lord's will. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 16 to 17, So then, be careful how you live. Do not be unwise, making the best use of your time, because the times are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. This is our key text. And then Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1 to 8, talks about time, that there is time for everything. And then Matthew chapter 24, verse 36, says, no one knows about the day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only uh, the Father. And we also have uh, Matthew chapter 24, verse 44, which says, so you also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. So at this end of the day, we don't have to forget our purpose in life. What is our purpose in life? And at the end of the day, what is our sole goal in life? Next point that we looked at is clearly define your, your priorities. Now in Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 to 2, uh, the Bible says, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. So we need to know our purpose in life. And the next point that we looked at is diligently make your plans. Now the Bible in the book of Proverbs chapter 21 verse 5 says, the plans of the diligent lead surely to abundance, but everyone who is hasty comes only to poverty. So we don't have to do things hastily. We need to do them properly. And now in Proverbs chapter 14 verse 8, the Bible says, the wisdom of the prudent is to discern his way, but the folly of fools is deceiving. So we have to be prudent. How is, what is, uh, how is prudent defined? It is acting with or showing care and thought for the future. So as we plan, as we manage our things, we still have to think about the future. The next point is seek him first every day. Now, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. I think most of us have memorized this verse. But do we do that is what is more important. And also the next point that we have looked at, commit your plans to the Lord. Now, in, uh, in Psalms uh, 37 verse 5, the Bible says, commit your, your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will act. And in Proverbs chapter 16 verse 3, commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established. So at the end of the day, we need to know who is the most important in our lives. It is God. So everything that we do, we need to commit ourselves to the Lord, even our plans. And the next point that we also looked at is ask the Lord what he wants you to do. Now in Psalms chapter 31, verse 14 to 15, the Bible says, but I trust in you, O Lord, I say, you are my God. My times are in your hand. And then in Proverbs chapter 19, verse 21, there are many plans in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the Lord's counsel that will stand. And then Proverbs chapter 16, verse 9, the heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establish his, establishes his steps. 
Next point is be watchful for divine interruptions. Now, the Bible says in James chapter 4, verse 13 to 15, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this for that. And that reminds me, uh, brothers and sisters, of our Muslim brothers and sisters, for everything that you say, oh, let's meet next week for this. Uh, we are going to do this next week. They will say, inshallah, meaning God willing. So we have to know that God's will prevails. The last and not least is work hard and don't be lazy. Now in Proverbs chapter uh, 14, verse 23, the Bible says, all hard work brings a profit, but mere talk leads only to poverty. So we need to work hard. The Bible says so. It's not only when our bosses push us at work, or it's not only when we are given tasks to do, but we need to work hard. And then in Proverbs chapter 6, verses, uh, verse 6 to 11, the Bible says, Take a lesson from the ants, you lazy bones. Learn from their ways and become wise. Though they have no prince or governor or ruler to make them work, they labor hard. How long will you sleep? When will you wake up? Oh, sorry, they labor hard all summer, gathering food for the winter. But you lazy bones, how long will you sleep? When will you wake up? A little extra sleep, a little more slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, then poverty will pounce on you like a bandit. Scarcity will attack you like an armed robber. Now we need to work hard. Now the next se section, we are going to... Okay, sorry. We are going to look at the three particular skills that separate time management success from failure as offered by Professor Eric. And these are awareness, arrangement, and adaptation. And also the other thing that we'll look at is how procrastination comes into picture and also affect our schedules. So under awareness, awareness is thinking realistically about your time by understanding it. By understanding it is a limited resource. Now, what are the values and key considerations in time management plan? We have to know what is most valuable to us and that will give us direction. Your energy should be oriented first towards things that reflect the values that are the most important. And then we need to examine our value, values to help us to make good time management decisions. And the next one is uh, arrangement. Arrangement is designing and organizing your goals, plans, and schedules, and tasks to, effect, to, eff to effectively use time. And how do we do this? The first thing we need to do is to set up our goals. Okay, so make your goals specific and concrete and don't be vague. Then set both long-term goals and short-term ones to support them. And then set a deadline for your goals. Integrate your goals, school, personal, okay, career, and then realize that goals change, but know which goals to stick to. And remember, in all this, God's will prevails. And again, you need to schedule Okay, the next thing that is important is scheduling. Now, before setting up your calendar, think strategically and carefully plan, and then prioritize important and urgent activities, and then block all study, family worship time, house chores, reading, prayer, which are the most important aspects of your life, and then highlight all the key dates uh, for exams or for project due dates, and then delegate the duties, and then uh, make provision for any other things that may come in as you do your schedule. And remember, there are only 24 hours in a day. The next one, and not least, is 
adaptation. Adaptation is monitoring your use of time while performing activities, including adjusting to interruptions and changing priorities. Now, how do we execute and manage change? We can see it is important to adjust to interruptions or changing priorities and acknowledging the realities of schedules. Uh, of schedule implementation to be successful in time management. Now, I will just give it a, 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 a short example from my workplace. At school, we recently had exams and uh, we had made provision for two exam papers since the students are not supposed, in case they are absent from uh, school, they are not supposed to do the same exam that is done by others. So we thought everything was planned accordingly. And then it so happened that there was one student now, remember, because of the use of technology now, we had to do all the exams on Google Forms. And then there was one student who had a problem of eye strain, so he couldn't use uh, the devices that others are using to do the exam. Now he was supposed to have his done on a, um, on a paper, on a hard copy. So we had... We had, we had to be given new instructions, okay, to make his own examination on the hard, uh, hard copy. Did we plan properly? Yes, we had. Did we manage to miss the deadlines? Yes, we did. But then something came up. Now this is where adaptation comes into place. The next thing that we are going to talk about is procrastination, which is a problem in our time management. We just thought it's better we discuss this as well. Now, what is procrastination? This is defined in the Oxford Dictionary as a delay or postponement of action. Now, some examples of delay or postponement of actions include ignoring the tasks, hoping it will go away, or underestimating how long it will take or overestimating your abilities and resources or telling yourself that poor performance is okay or insisting on perfection. We are not saying doing things perfect is not right, but insisting on it and then doing something else that isn't very important and then believing that repeated minor delays won't hurt you or talking about rather than doing it and then putting all your work on only one part of task. This thing was to a question. How do we overcome procrastination? Here are some of the guidelines. We need to learn to adapt to changes and interactions. We need to learn to win the mental battle by committing to being on time. We need to make sure that we set and keep deadlines and also organize, schedule, and plan properly. The other thing is we may have to divide big jobs into smaller tasks and also find ways to make our, our jobs or our tasks fun. And occasionally reward yourself, learn to reward yourself when you achieve some, 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 some tasks or goals. Another thing is you may tell your friends, colleagues or family members to remind you of priorities and deadlines. And the Last and not least is learn to say no to time wasters. Now, we are going to have a story by our daughter, uh, V. Hello, good evening, happy Sabbath, everyone. So I'm going to share a story uh, about um, time management. So this story is about one philosopher. He um, decided to teach his students about time management. So he went to his classroom as usual, and he got a big empty jar, placed it on the table. And with him, he had three items. He had big rocks, he had uh, pebbles, and he also had sand, a packet of sand. So this professor, he started to put uh, these rocks into the, the big jar. So he asked, after he finished, he asked his students uh, if the jar was full. And the class responded that yes, the jar was full. After that, he took a packet of pebbles, poured these pebbles into the, into the jar. He, sh he shook the jar gently 
to make sure that the pebbles filled all the empty spaces uh, that were left by the uh, big rock, the rocks. After that, he, again, every time he did this, he would ask the class if uh, the jar was full or not. So the class again responded that yes, and they were surprised and they said, yes, the jar was full. Um, after that, he went on and took a, a packet of sand and he poured this sand into the same jar with the rocks and the pebbles. He shook it very well and the sand filled every single space that was left by the pebbles and, this, and the rocks. He went on to explain to his uh, students that this jar represents your life. And the big rocks represent the most important or most valuable things in our lives. So these include your family, your partner, your children, uh, God, and the church community. And these pebbles represented uh, other less important things, not, not less important, but not the most significant things, which included work, uh, cars, um, clothes, or other things we have in our lives. And sand represented the least important things, which were which could be uh, things of the flesh, food, maybe pleasure, or games, and so on and so forth. So um, his moral of the story is that um, the jar represents, like I said, the jar represents uh, your life. So if you start to fill your life with the sand, which is the pity things that are not of prime importance, you're going to fill your life with non-important things. And therefore, you won't have uh, enough time for your family, for God, for other very important things. But if you start to fill your lives with the big rocks, which is family, which is spending time with God, even if you don't have the sand, you are still satisfied and you will find happiness in these things. So the moral of the story is that um, fill your life with the most important things, which are the rocks, spend time with God, spend time with family, spend time with you know, the, the people who are very close to you. And thereafter, you can always uh, have time for work. You can always have time to go out and so on and so forth. So this is the moral of the story. Thank you. Thank you Thank for you, that really. wonderful story, V. Uh, now to end our presentation, uh, brethren, uh, we have an activity. It's very short, and uh, we can see we didn't manage our time properly. So now this activity is about how we can identify whether these are truths or myths. Okay, so we want to identify this statement. We want to see if these statements represent truths or myths about time management. So you can write on a piece of paper quickly numbers one to 10, and then you can write M against a number if you think it's a myth, or you can write T against a number if you think it's a truth. So the first one says, time management is nothing but common sense. Do you think that's a truth or it's a myth? And then the next one, it takes all the fun out of your life. Is that a truth? Is that a myth? And then I work better under pressure. We've heard that statement and some of us have said it also. Is that a truth? Is that a myth about time management? And then no matter, no matter what I do, I don't have enough time. Is that a truth or myth? And then the next one says time management increases productivity. Is that a truth or myth? Uh, time management reduces stress. Is that a truth or myth? And then time management improves self-esteem. Is that a truth or myth? And then time management helps achieve balance in life. And then the next one, it increases self-confidence. And then last but not least, uh, time management helps you reach your goals. Is that uh, a truth or a myth? A myth? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, and gentlemen I think if we have done the activity, we have is. Okay, so the first four there are myths about time management, and the last uh, ones are the truths about time management. I hope you have enjoyed uh, this presentation, and we hope God will bless us and will help us to manage our time effectively, and we'll be able to accomplish many things, including what he has uh, created us for, which is our purpose in life. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. I just opportunity to share with you. Thank you.